In 1844, the Edgar Allan Poe wrote a short story called The Purloined Letter. And it's a, the a presumption behind it, the assumption behind it is really easy to understand. French detectives are looking through a Parisian hotel room and they're looking for a letter. They tear the whole place apart. They go inch by inch through every grid of the whole room. They use a microscope on the floorboards. They take apart the furniture. They stick needles through all the cushions. They even measure the, the book covers to see if the, the letter had been put in that. And it turns out in the end that the letter had been just on the mantelpiece the whole time. It was something that was hidden in plain sight. All of us are familiar with failures of perception. Philosophers and, um, philosophers and, uh, and cognitive scientists and art historians all teach us and remind us again and again that we simply do not see the world as it is. The, um, in many ways, the, the, the things that we see are, are always surprising us. We'll see something and not know that we saw it because we see it and, and know it subconsciously but don't know it. Um, uh, in our conscious thoughts. We'll, um, everything we see in our field of vision, the optic nerve means that we all have a blind spot. That means that we never even see what's right before us. So we'll ignore some things because they're too ordinary to, 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 to take notice. And we'll ignore other things because they're so strange we don't even have any conceptual categories for them. Now, uh, many people in this room are probably familiar with uh, an experiment that was done up the hill from here. It was an experiment, a psychological experiment, where there was a, a subject who was asked to count the number of times a ball was passed between different researchers. And the researchers are all jogging around in and out, and it's like the three-man weave in basketball. I don't even know if they do that anymore. But they're jogging around, and, and the, the person who's watching them is supposed to count how many times the ball goes back and forth. And in the middle of the whole thing, in, the, in this craziness, a person comes in wearing a gorilla suit and stands in the middle and hesitates and waits there, for a good bit, and then um, disappears out of sight. And when they ask the people, and they say, listen, uh, tell us a little bit, how many times was the basketball passed? They'll say, um, well, did you notice anything else different about it? Did you see the person in the gorilla suit? And between one third and half the people fail to see the person in the gorilla suit. So that's um, called inattentional blindness. I mean, it's something so obvious right before us that we don't see. And um, it's inspired a lot of different kinds of experiments beyond this. One of them is an experiment that Harvard University professors did on radiologists. So radiologists are the people who read the slides that help us to know whether we have cancer or not. They're experts at noticing tiny differences in, in optical images. And so they gave them this image right here of a lung, and you can see that it's a, a crossway section. And um, I wonder, how many of you, first of all, have heard of the gorilla experiment already? Yeah, so I, I'm... Now, how many of you um, know what's, what's interesting about this, this image right here? Yeah, so, so what is it? What's, what, what's, the, what's special about this? Yeah, that's right. So there's the gorilla right there in the top right corner. <laughs> so that gorilla, I'm, I, you know, a few of you noticed um, the gorilla. When the Harvard researchers asked the radiologists, 83% of the radiologists failed to see the gorilla that was right there. It's right there, like little King Kong right there in the corner. So my question this afternoon is, I'm asking and wondering what is hidden in plain sight? What's right there in front of us that we don't see, but which may be very important for our happiness, may be very important for our well-being? And I want to talk about two um, two, uh, two uh, figures, two thinkers, who really believed very strongly that there's something hidden right in front of us. There's something about the world that's being hidden in plain sight. The first is Christopher Alexander. Christopher Alexander was an architect at UC Berkeley for decades and decades. And in the early part of his career, he and a bunch of colleagues were famous for introducing and inventing an idea called pattern languages. These pattern languages have been very helpful for um, computer scientists. Um, Christopher Alexander is the person who inspired video games. Um, the Spore is one video game he in inspired. The Sims is another video game he inspired. And what Christopher Alexander taught was he says there's a conventional wisdom about beauty. And the conventional wisdom is that beauty is something that's completely subjective. And that beauty doesn't really matter very much. Um, what matters so much more is usefulness. He says pretty much most of us assume that you like what you like and I like what I like and there's no way really to arbitrate between the, different, between the two of us. There's no way to really measure beauty or to understand it in any objective kind of way. 
So Alexander, um, in many ways, was inspired by um, modern architecture. He looked at buildings like these, and I really look at these buildings and think about how they make you feel. Um, he pointed out that architects uh, in the 20th century were able to do things with materials that just didn't even exist before. There are new technologies that made it possible for um, them to create things that had never been done before. And he said that in a way, that ego involvement, the ego, egotism of trying to create something that had never existed before, overrode their interest in creating things where people, um, where people could thrive things that people found beautiful, think places that people wanted to live, um, workplaces that people wanted to work in. And so he said not only are these just ugly buildings, he said that they, there's something about them that depresses the human spirit, that harms us spiritually. And he compares this with um, other kinds of um, buildings. These are um, buildings in uh, non-Western societies. And he says there's something very different about these. He says there's a sense of connection that we feel with them. There's a sense of beauty and calm and almost inward peace that we feel in, in buildings like this. And so Alexander was starting to come to these conclusions about a third of the way through his career. And so it was um, an, an enormous epiphany for him to realize suddenly that a lot of the buildings that he was making weren't buildings that had what he calls life in them. Now life for him is something that is inherent in every single piece of space, in every single object, everything that's made by human beings, everything that's natural. He says that every, every, every level of being, um, there's an objective amount of life that can be measured and understood in, in, in everything that you encounter. So what Alexander decided to do was to understand better what this life was. And so he would give people um, two different images. And he would say, I want you to look at both these images, and I want you to tell me which of these images has more life, which feels more like your inner self as you would like it to be. And so here's an example of one of the slides he'd show. Um, and I wonder, just among you, um, how many of you um, regard the top slide as having more life? All right. Okay, that's good. Now, how about... The bottom slide there. Yeah, good, good. So that's, that's pretty much what he found to be the case also. He said it's hard to do this, by the way. I mean, it's hard to, to be asked by someone in this context and not think, is everybody else raising their hand? Is everybody else not raising their hand? You know, it's hard to, 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 to calm all that noise down and to really listen to how these images make you feel. So here's another, um, here's another a pair of um, of slides that um, he gave as an example. So on the left, you have Annapolis, Maryland. On the right, you have Tucson, Arizona. How many people think Annapolis has more life in these images? Okay, great. And how many about Tucson? Yeah, yeah, that's good. So um, he does this with all sorts of different things. He'll give two different chairs, two different cups, two different um, sideways sections of sidewalk. Sometimes it's hard to tell which image has more life because the images seem so similar. So here um, we have um, two sections of road. At first they look very similar to each other. He says the one on the left has more life. It's not a road cut. It doesn't interrupt the shape of the hill and it has more life and people at a deep level recognize that. Sometimes it's hard to understand what he says has more life because um, it, uh, the, the, the images look pretty much um, the same, it's kind of hard to tell on this one. He says that the image on the left here, the one that has the little house in the parking lot, that that one has more life because there are more levels of scale. There's, it makes it more beautiful. But he uses this mirror of the self test to compare all sorts of crazy things. You know, art objects, prayer rugs, an ax and a screwdriver, a can of rubber cement and a pair of scissors. He even uses it to compare a dime and a nickel. And he says the dime has more life. It's hard to get, I mean, it's hard to understand, but his point is, can you really listen to what's in front of you and really know what it makes you feel? Now, the hardest one for me, I think, and um, the one that, uh, that he's really famous for is this image right here. Next slide. <laughs> he shows people an image of this ordinary salt shaker and a, and, a, and a bottle of ketchup. And what he says is that 80% of people find the salt shaker to have more life than the ketchup bottle. Now, um, Alexander, his point isn't to try to, um, to, 
to express some kind of religious ideology. He's not trying to change um, the way that you, you understand the world. What he's trying to do is he's trying to think of a language, think of, uh, of um, concepts that will help people to build things that are more beautiful. We're pouring millions of tons of concrete every year, and he says it's very important for us to be in touch with that intuitive self in order to build things that are beautiful. And so Alexander, even though, like I said, he's not a religious person, he's, he's, he doesn't have a religious ideology, it's hard for him not to speak in religious terms. Next slide. Um, it's, not, it's hard for him to not speak in religious terms when he, um, when he talks about this. So this is what he says. He says, when I look at a thing which has a living quality, sometimes I am aware of it almost as if it is faintly glowing. In my later years, as I have encountered this sensation more and more concretely and with more and more certainty, it seems to me that I am seeing God, the glowing of all things, shining out from that old brick wall or from that bush or from that face or from flowers in a vase. So the important part is the world evokes something from us. We feel a sense of life in the objects that we encounter um, every day. And in, um, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to, the second person I want to talk about, this is an easy talk to follow. There's two figures, that one and this one. Henry David Thoreau also believed that there was a way in which the world was alive. Um, and uh, I think a lot of you have read excerpts from his essay on civil disobedience, and most of you probably are familiar also with Walden. Um, college professors say that Walden, um, the, book, the book that he wrote uh, in the 19th century, that Walden is the most important book to read in American literature from the 19th century. And um, Walden is, a, it's, it's, a story, we talk about Walden Pond, and people on the West sometimes don't realize how big the pond is. It's a half a mile across, and this is the, the short version right here, the, the close distance. So it's really a huge body of water. And he lived there, um, thanks, uh, in a house uh, that he made himself. So this is a replica of the house that he lived in when he was there. And uh, the house he, he made was um, out of recycled materials and was thrown out when he was done. But this is a replica of it. It's a very small house. And he went there, and he, he, this is what, how he described why he went to live in Wal by Walden Pond for two years. I came to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Now, when I was first heard about this, my friends and I would have these big debates, like, uh, how hard it was it really to live by Walden Pond? It's, he could take his laundry home to his mom for the weekends, you know? The, and, and, and we kind of wrote it off. But the older I get, the longer I think about this, the more I admire anyone who is able to focus his or her life and to eliminate distractions and really pay attention to something. In Thoreau's case, it was paying attention to nature and to pay attention to its effects on him, how it made him feel. Now, um, many people think that Thoreau went to Walden Pond, you know, wrote a book, went, went home afterwards, wrote a book about it, and that was pretty much that. Um, but what happened to Thoreau at Walden Pond ended up in, in, in informing his entire life afterwards. When Thoreau died, his best friend, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, gave the eulogy, the, 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 the funeral oration at his, at his funeral. And so he, um, Emerson said about his best friend, he said, you know, Thoreau, my friend, really wasn't as much of a success as he should have been. He, um, could, have, he could have been a great engineer or a great statesman, or he could have done all these things, um, but really his career was pretty disappointing. And um, people, sometimes, some people admire Emerson for, you know, speaking the truth. Other people say, well, you shouldn't say that at your friend's funeral. Um, but in many ways, on outward surface appearances, Thoreau didn't uh, seem to have accomplished very much. He didn't seem like very much of a success. Um, he would work as a surveyor, and uh, he, would, um, he basically made the minimum amount of money that he needed to in order to live. He lived in his parents' attic for his adult life. And in the afternoons, what he would do is he would go for long walks through meadows and the forests, and he would take little pencil notes about what he saw on these long walks. And at nighttime, he would read writers that inspired him. And in the morning, he would get up and he would write this, his journal. It's a two million word journal that takes those, those pencil notes and expresses the most beautiful ideas that you may ever see in your life. 
He writes about blizzards and tracks of animals through snowstorms. He writes about what it's like to wade up and down the, the Concord River. He explores fish nests. He climbs a pine tree and, and sees a hawk's nest firsthand. He writes about what it felt like to skate up and down the river and explore the different towns in that way. But he pays attention to nature in a way that's unparalleled. Now, when Thoreau died, after Emerson, long after he gave the, the funeral oration I described earlier, Thoreau's friends got together and said, these writings are very special. And they published the first, they published little excerpts of them. And this is the way that Thoreau became famous. When he died, he was not someone that people knew about. But pretty soon, people recognized the value of this writing. They recognized that he was a literary success. They recognized that he was a um, scientific success, too. And they also began to recognize that he was a kind of spiritual success, too. He went there to feel a sense of intimacy with nature, and he accomplished that in his life. So this is what um, Thoreau um, writes. Uh, you know, he wrote, like I said, two million words. It means he wrote thousands of whoop, um, passages like this. He writes, there is nothing so sanative, healing, so poetic as a walk in the woods and fields. Nothing so inspires me. I come to myself. It is as if I always met in those places some grand, serene, immortal, infinitely encouraging, though invisible companion and walked with him. I love and celebrate nature. So just like Christopher Alexander, Thoreau had an idea that there's something in nature that is alive. Um, Alexander writes, this is not just a dead mechanical universe that we inhabit. And these two writers really speak to me in particular because when I was uh, in a, in a teenager and my English lit class went up to Ashland, Oregon for the Shakespeare Festival, um, that night, we, we stayed at a campground that was outside of town, and there was a lake there, and I was going to sleep with all my buddies in the tent that we all had together, and it turned out someone set up an extra tent, and that night, I um, said, well, hey, if there's an extra tent, I'm going to sleep there and not hear you guys snoring. Uh, so I went, and I, and I went into that tent, and even though it wasn't my practice, I, didn't, I, I never did this before, um, that night, I, I, I prayed before I went to bed. I, it's not like it's something I did every time, every night. Um, but the next morning, I woke up at like two hours before sunrise, and I felt just incredibly energetic. I knew I wasn't going to go back to sleep. And so I go outside my tent, everybody's sound asleep, and I decided to go for a walk around the lake. Now, as the sun began to come up and the sky began to get lighter, um, I, I had the most extraordinary experience. Um, it was almost like it was the first day of creation. It was almost like everything that I saw was completely new. And it was so moving to me. I mean, it was such an emotional experience. I mean, literally tears were coming down my face. And in the midst of all that, in my heart, I heard a voice that said, this is all created. Now, I don't have any idea how to explain what it was that happened. Um, and I gotta say, not every day is exactly like that. But the echo of that experience, so long ago, it still informs every single day of my life. It's the reason why I take time to take my earphones out and really listen and look around me. It's, it's the reason why I ask myself constantly, what am I experiencing right now that is beautiful, that I can give thanks for? And it's a different way of looking at the world, to look for what is happening right before you. Now, you don't have to agree with Christopher Alexander and think that every single point, every single object has an amount of life that can be measured and empirically discussed. You don't have to agree with Christopher Alexander to understand that there is something about the world that can evoke great feelings in us. And similarly, you don't have to go for four-hour walks every day and live in your parents' attic to, um, to agree with Thoreau um, he says, quote, to strive to get nearer to the origin of things. He also says, to feel your maker blessing you. Do not lose yourself in academic, athletic, professional achievement. You do not have to accept the assumption of people around you who tell you that we are just isolated egos inhabiting a dead world. 
Take time to really see the gorillas around you. Take time to listen to what your feelings are, to create something beautiful. Look and listen to the presence that surrounds you. Thank you.